join me in your Bibles in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 this morning, we will be looking at verses 31 through 36. Romans 8, 31 through 36. No military commander throughout history has ever won a battle by himself. To be successful, he needs the support of a well-trained army who will follow him regardless of the cost. And that will largely determine if it be a stunning victory or a helpless defeat. One need only read of Leonidas as he bravely led his 300 Spartans to the inevitable defeat uh, at uh, Thermopylae. History has had its share of skilled leaders. Julius Caesar, Hannibal, later Napoleon. However, all three of these men must pay homage to a single individual and his army, Alexander the Great of the fourth century BC. He conquered most of the known world at his time. From his father, King Philip of Macedonia, Alexander the Great inherited a versatile, well-trained army unlike anything that had ever existed before then. United in a single purpose, they all fought as one. Alexander recognized this. He's quoted as saying, remember upon the conduct of each depends the fate of all. And although he owes much of his success to his father's foresight, the young king's achievements in battle can be traced back to the origin of what's called the hoplite phalanx of early Greece. Now around 700 BC, the hoplite phalanx was a formation of close ordered soldiers that were created in which the hoplites would, uh, would move to the front lines of the ranks. Now the hoplites, they were soldiers named for the hoplin, which was a shield. And they would lock their shields together and then the next few ranks of soldiers would come behind them and their spears would protrude uh, protrude through those shields. Now at the time, Greece was emerged in a dark period of history. These were the troubling times during uh, the lifetime of the poet Homer. There was an emergence of the city-state, the expansion of colonies founded as near as Ionia, Ionia and as far away as Sicily, and with trade and the Greek world expanding for political and economic reasons, each city had to learn to defend itself. Two powerful city-states rose to dominate Greece. While Athens would become a naval power, Sparta easily emerged as the atypical military city, initiating a strict code of conduct with intense military training for every male citizen. It was the birth of every citizen warrior uh, community to come after that. Every citizen was required to defend the city in a time of war. Now, although a Spartan boy learned enough to be literate, More importantly, he learned how to endure pain and to conquer in battle and in essence to fight as a unit and not as an individual. The city itself was like an armed camp. And this intense training became evident when Greece was invaded by the Persians under the command of Darius I and later his son Xerxes. However, an army, even one that was as well trained as that from Macedonia, could not have functioned as well without the capable leadership of Alexander. He was said to have sound judgment, fearless, agile, with insightful strategy, able to lead his men to attack with terror. Although he would show respect for his enemy, he was said to be afraid of no one. Alexander once said, I am not afraid of any army of lions led by a sheep. I am afraid of an army of sheep led by a lion. He was a bad man. 
Now, one of his remarkable abilities was to anticipate the strategy of his opponent, often drawing him onto the terrain of his own choosing. Now, by the time of Alexander, the fighting force that took him across both Greece and Persia had been perfected. He crossed through Asia into India, often fighting forces that outnumbered him greatly. And his use of the phalanx and cavalry combined with an innate sense of command put his enemy on the defensive, enabling him to never lose a battle after 15 years of almost constant warfare. Now surely, if you were fighting in Alexander's army, or if you were a Macedonian citizen, after the first few victories, you would begin to get a sense that there was nothing you had to worry about. Your nation was not going to be defeated. Part of what made the army so great and the kingdom so powerful was the sense that after these early, earlier victories, they thought and everyone else thought that they were unstoppable and that anyone who sought to battle them would ultimately fail. Victory builds confidence. And after a while, that confidence builds into a mindset that says, stay the course, the victory is already ours before the battle ever begins. And this morning, as we look at Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter eight, it's as if the apostle Paul is our Alexander the Great, a lion leading sheep. And as we consider our text, as we think about the battles of this life and the buildings uh, around us that seek to, uh, to hem us in and to bring us down, we can come into this Christian life with a sense that we will not fail. Yes, there may be some difficult challenges along the way. Yes, we, we may struggle at times to stay motivated and focused on the prize. Yes, we may see some of our fellow fighters fall on the battlefield, but he gives us what we need to keep pushing, to keep fighting, and to keep remembering who our great king is and what he has promised. We do have a lion as a leader. And he brings all of his sheep into the battle. But the difference between an earthly king like Alexander and our king, of course, is that ours is truly sovereign and he has already won the ultimate battle. But all of the battles along the way need not take away our focus and our drive and our persistence and our intensity and our overwhelming sense that with our king, with the army of God, there is no chance of defeat. This is where Paul brings us in our text this morning. So let's read together Romans 8, beginning in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Amen. Well, throughout the chapter of Romans 8, if you read the whole chapter, we learn how God the Holy Spirit is at work in the lives of his people. The whole chapter really is about the work of the Holy Spirit, and that's a point that's very often missed by Christians, even though it's by far the most popular chapter in the entire Bible. It's a gloriously wonderful chapter and we learn so much about what God is doing in the life of a believer through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to give us in our experience a greater sense of our communion with God. 
and it's an overflow of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is mentioned 17 times in this chapter, more than any other chapter of scripture, and Paul is, is showing us what he does and what his work is in the lives of his people. And it's interesting to note this morning that the Spirit, really, as we get to these verses, he isn't mentioned in these concluding verses. Well, why would that be? Well, because if you read the entire chapter, Paul leads you on this journey to see that everything from start to finish in the Christian life is led by, is directed by the Holy Spirit who is working in our lives, who's working in the circumstances all around us. And so we can see that Paul shows us what is a result of the Spirit having been doing this and what he continues to do in this. So Paul leads us right into the conclusion that it is the Spirit's work that assures us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now very quickly, I want to give us an overview of the chapter leading up to this point. It's it's important for us to see so that we can understand the placement of these verses in our passage today. Again, in chapter 8, Paul teaches us that it is the work of the Spirit that brings about the new birth, our faith in Christ. He says that right at the beginning. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When we are justified, which Paul has written about extensively by this point in Romans, We enter into a state of being whereby we no longer have to fear condemnation because we have been changed. We have been transformed by the Spirit. We have been born again to new life. And in that new life, we are not condemned, but we are secure on the basis of the life and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul shows that not only are we pardoned, And no longer are we under the condemnation of God, but we are adopted as the sons of God. This is an amazing reality, right? Because it's it's one thing to be let off death row and to be told you've been pardoned. That's amazing in and of itself. But it's, it's something quite remarkable that after the judge tells you you've been let off death row, you've been pardoned, that now the judge leaves his bench and adopts you as his own child. And when we are adopted, the work of the Spirit begins to work to sanctify us. He, he begins to show us what it is to live life as Christians. And, and as we move along in this life and as we grow in our holiness, we grow in our godliness, we grow in our relationship with God and with one another, we have a, a, an increasing sense of who God truly is and that God truly is for us and that we can always turn to him as our Abba Father the one who has called us his very own child. The spirit works this within us. We can trust that he loves us. We can trust that he cares for us. We can start acting like adopted children instead of like frightened slaves and orphans. We have all of the rights and all of the gifts and all of the blessings of a child. I was thinking about that just the other day. My wife and I were talking about that, and she noticed that when my son comes by my office, he just barges right in, but if his friends are with him, they stop at the door. They don't come in. But that's the blessing. That's the benefit. That's the gift of being a child, right? We have privileges that others don't have with our father. We can come to our father As I think C.S. Lewis said, how dare anyone think other than a child that they could ask the king for a glass of water in the middle of the night? And that's the blessing and the privilege we have as his children. We're becoming more and more like Christ and we're seeing the work of God in our lives by the power of the Spirit. And as we do that, we realize there's no greater good in this life. So at every level, the Holy Spirit is working within his people to bring you into the kingdom, 
to grow you as citizens of the kingdom and to continue to pour out his grace in your life to give you all that you need to continue to persevere in all that God has called you to do as a citizen of his kingdom. The Puritan pastor Richard Sibbs wrote, sometimes our spirits cannot stand in trials. Therefore, sometimes the immediate testimony of the spirit is necessary. It comes in saying, I am thy salvation. And our hearts are stirred up and they're comforted with joy inexpressible. Sometimes it is so clear and strong, we question nothing. He says this witness weighs on and overpowers the soul. Hence rises what Peter says, joy unspeakable and full of glory. It can be an overwhelming joy. Have you experienced that overwhelming joy of the work of the Spirit in your life being reminded of the love of God? And so now Paul is is taking all of this here at the end of the chapter and he asks, what then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, if this God, our Father who has adopted us is for us, then who can be against us? If all of this is true, if all of this is a reality in your life, what do you have to fear, dear Christian? You are aligned in the fight behind the great king who never loses. The great sovereign who cannot be defeated and he has secured for you everlasting life. So what do you have to fear? So in verses 31 and 32, we see the overarching umbrella statement for everything else that follows. It's the summary of everything else that Paul is going to explain. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Isn't that a gloriously wonderful statement? Your father will give you all things. He's not withholding and he won't withhold. Paul is saying, look, Christian, You are undoubtedly struggling with something in your life and it may be right now that you're at the bottom of the pit of despair. But do not be afraid and do not think that God has forgotten you. Remember what he has done for you. Remember that he gave you Christ. Remember that he gave him up for you that you may have everlasting life. He did that for you, and if you know, if you hold on to that fact of all that he has done for you, how will he not also graciously give you everything you need to make it through this life? He will, brothers and sisters, he will. Now, sometimes the circumstances of life might be so difficult that it doesn't feel like he is, but he is and he will, because remember what the ultimate goal is. It's not ease of life. It's not complete comfort. It's not a life without suffering. But it is, as Paul says earlier in Romans 8, our being conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's our becoming more like Christ. And if you think that will come without suffering, you don't understand what Christ did for you. So from this, Paul really deals with one of our big problems, and that is that we all tend at times to have this internal struggle as Christians, especially when things are tough or when our affections for Christ have waned or are weak, and we think, how could God ever put up with me? How could he ever care about me? Look at all my sin. Look at my lack of faith. Why would God ever want anything to do with me? And you'll maybe encounter difficulties in your life when you're thinking that way and you'll say, see, look, all of this is happening to me, so this must mean that God really doesn't love me. He really hasn't taken me as his child. He really isn't paying attention to me at all. And we sort of wallow in self-pity and doubt. But then the apostle Paul comes in and he says, listen, Christ died for you. 
the incarnate God lived a perfect life for you and he died a sinner's death for you and he's not just pleased to sort of see you through but he's giving you all things and he's pleading on your behalf. He's interceding on your behalf and he's not just pleading for mercy on your behalf. God gives you mercy but that's not what Christ is pleading for you. Christ is your advocate. Christ is standing in your place. Christ is taking all the wrath of God that was reserved for you onto himself. You don't need a lawyer to plead for mercy. You need an advocate to take your place and that's what Christ does. So why are you carrying the fear of man, the self-hatred, the narcissism, the self-absorption, the power of lust? Why are you carrying all of that with you through this life, Christian? Look to Christ, see what he accomplished for you. And if he is for you, who or what in this world could possibly ever stand a chance against you? He will graciously give you all things. So right out of the gate in this text, the Apostle Paul says, who cares what kind of charges come against you? Whether it's internal or external, who cares what other people say about you? Who cares what the culture thinks about you? Jesus is your advocate. He intercedes for you. Remember the amazing line from John Newton's hymn, let us wonder Grace and justice join and point to mercy's store when through grace in Christ our trust is, justice smiles and asks no more. Justice asks no more of us because Christ is in our place. No one is denying that you are a sinner. I know you. (laughs) No one's denying that and me as well. And in fact, your sin is far more grievous than you could ever even imagine. But you are a child of God. And so Paul asks in verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It's Jesus Christ who is interceding at the right hand of God. It is God who has declared you, God the judge, God the jury, God the executioner. It is him who has declared you not guilty on the basis of the work of Christ and now you are his child. It's because of him that you are amongst the elect. It is because of him that you are secure. It is because of him that you have nothing to fear. It is because of him that you live and move and have your being. It is because of him that you might wake up in the morning and think of all of your sin and all of your shortcomings and all of your grief and all of your pain and challenges and woes in this life, but you can be reminded once again that you are his and he is yours, so you are secure, you are safe, and you are on a solid rock that cannot move. You are on the great sovereign God and king who cannot be thwarted. And so Paul asks in verse 24, who in the world is going to condemn you? Paul reminds us once again of verse one, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them all and thousands more, but Jehovah knoweth none. Christ died for you. Christ was raised for you. Christ is at the right hand of God for you, interceding for you. How wonderful is that? You see, Paul here is just, he's piling on the affirmations, one after the other after the other. He's just heaping up blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus, that we know just how solid this rock is that we stand upon, that we can have a greater confidence in our faith. And remember, all of this is applied to us and worked in us and gives us what we need to make it another day because the Holy Spirit dwells within his people conforming us to Christ. Yes, the evil one may stand to remind you of all that you have done, but you can look at old Satan and say, you know what, you're right. 
I know you're right. In fact, I'm worse than you say I am. But Christ is my advocate. Christ died for me. Christ defeated you, Satan. Christ defeated sin when he was lifted up from the grave and now sits on high. So what can you do to me? Your flesh may come out and tell you the things all around you are so alluring. Just try it. Just give in. Just enjoy it. Yes, God has said do not, but you will really like it. And you can tell the flesh, I have the spirit of God within me, so I have all that I need to resist the temptations of you. I have all that I need to continue to walk in obedience to God. I have all that I need to know that what you offer is always lacking in what it promises. You have nothing that can replace what God has given me in Christ Jesus. You may have all the world coming against you and offering its enticements and its condemnations. You only live once. Do what you want. You're tied down. Free yourself. Besides, you say you love God. You say you want to obey God. But look at your life. You're a hypocrite. You can say these things all you want, but we know better. We know you aren't who you say you are. Have you heard that before? But we can tell the world, listen, I know. I'm no better than you. In fact, I know that I'm worse than you think I am. But my God is the God who created all things and who loves me and who by his grace is changing me day by day. And although I am not and never will be perfect in this life, Christ is perfect and Christ stands in my place as my advocate. So I don't need your affirmation. I don't need to appease you. And I certainly don't need to pretend that I'm perfect because I'm a man, I'm a woman just like you. And so what Paul is doing is showing us that the triumph of Christ that we see in verse 34 is the foundation of our justification that we see in verse 33. The reason an infinitely holy and just God can justify the ungodly by faith alone is because of what Christ did in verse 34. He told us God did not spare his own son. And so he spells that out. He shows us what the Son of God actually did so that the Father could justify the ungodly by faith and remove all condemnation. So not only is Paul reminding us that there is no condemnation, he's also saying there are no condemners. John Stott saw this and he wrote, we can therefore confidently challenge the universe with all of its inhabitants, human and demonic, Who is he that condemns? There will never be an answer. And so Paul asks that glorious question in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And we know the answer, don't we? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation? Distress? Persecution? Famine? Nakedness? Danger? Sword? You can almost... Here Paul saying, give me a break. What are they going to do? Kill me? Send me to be with Christ? For to me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. Go ahead, kill me. And he, he's very intentional here, mentioning some very terrible things because he wants to make sure that we know what he's not saying. He wants to make sure we know he's not saying that there really are some things that are so horrible that they really could separate us from the love of Christ. But he says, no, there is nothing. You'll you'll endure tribulation, but Christ still loves you. You will have distress, but Christ still loves you. You may endure famine, but Christ still loves you. You may be left without any clothing on your back, but Christ still loves you. You may face horrible danger. Enemies may brandish their swords before you and use them against you, but Christ still loves you. So the first thing we need to see in this verse is that it isn't a past love. Christ loved us when he saved us, and and that is gloriously true, but that's not the whole picture, is it? Christ loves us right now. 
And the reason Paul can say that nothing will separate us from the love of Christ is because Christ is alive and is still loving us right now. He is at the right hand of God and is therefore ruling over all of us. And he is interceding for us, which means he is seeing to it that his finished work of redemption does in fact save us hour by hour and bring us safely into everlasting life. His love is not a past memory. It's an irrevocably true moment by moment action by the omnipotent living son of God. And notice, it's it's important that we see that Paul has a very specific people in mind when he writes this. It's not about all mankind. Yes, I do believe that God has a certain kind of love for all mankind, but it's not the kind of love he's writing about here for his specific people, right? We can all understand what that is like. For example, God loves all mankind in the way that I love my neighbor, But if I love my neighbor's wife in the way that I love my wife, we're gonna have a problem, right? I love all of your children dearly, sweet, wonderful children, little sinners that they are. (laughs) But the love I have for my children is very different. It is very unique. And it's in this same way. God loves all of mankind but his love for his children is very different and very unique. It is Christ's specific particular love for his church that we're talking about. Anyone, no exceptions, anyone who trusts in Christ can say, I am part of Christ's church, his called and chosen ones, the ones who verse 35 says are kept and protected forever no matter what. But notice something about this love. Christ's love does not spare us from all the things he mentions, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. These things will not separate us from the love of Christ, but Christ's love is not a deterrent to the harsh realities of life in a fallen world. That's important for us to remember. Yes, we won't be separated from Christ's love by these things, but that doesn't mean they won't come into our lives. Death comes for all of us. From the godly to the ungodly, it is coming for us in this life. Paul actually mentions that later down in verse 38. (coughs) Death will happen, but it will not separate us from Christ's love. So when Paul writes in verse 35 that the sword may be coming, that doesn't mean that if we are loved by Christ that we will not face the sword. It it, it means that even if we do face the sword, it will not separate us from Christ's love. If we do face the sword, it doesn't mean that he doesn't love us. But even more significant in terms of this reality in verse 36, Paul is abundantly clear as he quotes Psalm 44, 22. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Do you know what that means? It means that on some level, we need to realize that as we live life in a fallen world, we need to be settled on the reality that we don't get a pass when it comes to the atrocities of evil that are committed in this world. It's actually an anomaly throughout all of human history in Western civilization, and specifically in America, that we really don't have any sense whatsoever of what it means to live in a time and a place of persecution where martyrdom is the norm. We are in incredibly blessed. And so as, as Christians, we can, you know, we can look at our culture and we can bemoan the fact that so much is going on with moral degradation and all of the challenges we face and, and certainly we don't want to see that. We want to preserve something of, of godliness and holiness in the culture around us but the reality is even as bad as it may seem, my goodness, we've seen nothing, nothing even close to what the world endures 
where Christians reside. Did you know it's estimated that approximately 165,000 Christians are slaughtered for their faith every single year in this world? That's what happens in the world, and we really don't know much about it. Out of sight, out of mind in our context, but it's really something that could come for any of us. And when it comes, what does the Bible tell us? Don't be surprised. Why would you be surprised? It's exactly what happens to God's people. It's exactly what Jesus said of himself. Remember, some of you will be put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. They did it to me. They'll do it to you. So the love of Christ doesn't rescue us from the atrocities of sin in this world, but it absolutely does preserve us for everlasting life in the presence of God, even through suffering and death. Now, last thing, I want you to notice the word spare in verse 32. If you believe in hell, if you believe in the wrath of God, if you believe in perfect justice, the word spare should shake you. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Jesus Christ endured the full weight, the full measure of God's wrath that was reserved for all who were called the sons of God. He pulled no punches. On the cross, Jesus took on himself more than any man will ever endure because he endured all of God's wrath for all of his people who are in Christ Jesus. Now, why is that important? Well, Paul wants us ultimately to look to Christ. And if you know that Christ suffered and that Christ died in your place under the wrath of the Father, enduring the reality that for the first time ever throughout all eternity, the father turned his face away from the son. When you are suffering, dear Christian, don't you dare say, I guess God doesn't love me. I guess God has forgotten me. Are you kidding me? Is your life miserable? It happens. But if it is, don't say, There can't be any way that this is meant to be. God can't love me or else this wouldn't happen to me. God loved his son with an infinite love. But if you understand what the wrath of a holy God truly is, there is no way you could ever look at your misery and your struggle and your pain and your suffering and say, God isn't there. He left me to die on my own. If God was willing to give us his son, and if his son was willing to take all of that upon himself, can you imagine why God would ever withhold anything short of that from you? Imagine if you went out to buy a brand new $500,000 Lamborghini tomorrow. Not today, it's the Lord's day, but tomorrow. And as you go into the salesman's office and you're closing the deal and you tell the salesman, now, one last thing. I am going to buy this. I have all the money right here. But only if you throw in some free all-weather mats. A $500,000 car. Do you think the salesman's going to say, nope, sorry, can't do it. We can't throw those in. Are they going to pass up a half a million dollar sale because of some free floor mats? I don't think so. And this is the kind of thing that Paul is saying. This is the argument he's making. God didn't spare his own son. He's willing to endure the flames of hell for you. He was willing to let his son take it all for you. So do you really think he's not going to give you all things? God is not stingy. God is not miserly. God is not indifferent. No, in fact, he has a perfect reason for why the things in your life are happening the way that they're happening right now. So you look at the suffering of Christ and you say, first of all, I can't say, Lord, if I have an easy life, that's the way I know you love me. Because that's not what happened to Jesus. 
But secondly, I know if you're withholding on me, it can't be because you're mad at me. It can't be because you hate me. It can't be because you're not generous. It can't be because you're not powerful. Now, friends, some of you might be here this morning and think, I don't believe in hell and wrath. In fact, I believe if there is a God, he just loves everybody. I don't think you have to come through Jesus Christ. If that's you, I pray that you will realize something this morning. If you don't believe in Jesus and you don't believe in hell and you you don't believe in wrath, you don't believe in punishment for sin, if you don't believe Jesus Christ did all of this that you could have everlasting life, then you have a very different view of God's love than what God himself has told us. You may think it cost him nothing. It's all an abstraction. It's philosophical. It's sentimental. If that's the case, and you're actually honest with yourself, you will admit that you'll never be able to deal with trouble or hardship or, per, or, or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Never. That sense of love will never take you through those things because it's baseless. There's no foundation in that kind of thinking. Remember what we were just saying? When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my strength, God's strength, all sufficient shall be thy supply. The kind of love you have in mind, if you don't know Jesus Christ, isn't going to do that. Why not? Because you have, you have only the love of others at best, and they will fail you. And people, other people make terrible gods. And so you can't sing these words with any true meaning. That soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I will never, no, never, no, never forsake. And if you don't know and believe that Jesus Christ endured the wrath of God because he was spared, he was, he was not spared to do so in your place rather than forsake you, these words don't mean much to you. But the whole idea Your sense of God's love will never bring you through, but Paul's teaching us this morning on God's love will absolutely will see you through everything, and it's the job of the Holy Spirit to persuade you of that. Do you know what ails you today? The reason you're anxious is that you're not living as though you're loved if you're a Christian. That's where anxiety comes from. Do you know that? You, you don't believe you're actually loved by God. That's why you're worried. That's why you're anxious. You're proud. But his love will, ma- will melt you down to humility. His love will melt away the anxiety down into peace. If you're feeling guilty and you're spending all of your time flagellating yourself, you're not living in the love of Christ no matter what your problem is, no matter what it is, you don't believe this. You're not persuaded. But you can go to the Lord today and you can go to the Lord, in fact, right now and ask him, Lord, show me what it means to be loved by you. Jesus Christ is sweet and his mercies are tender. And he calls you to come to him by faith. If you are not a Christian this morning, the Lord Jesus is calling on you to come to him by faith, to put all of your hope and all of your trust and all of your love into him. And he will not turn you away. When you come in humility before our God, he does not say, leave me, I want nothing to do with you. He says, come to me. Give me all of your burdens. Give me all of your pain. Give me all of your suffering. And I'm not saying it's going to go away in this life that you will have those things. But what I am saying is that I will love you with such a love that it can never be taken away by anything. Do you want that kind of love in your life? Jesus says, come to me. Look to me. His burden is not heavy. It's light. His yoke is easy. 
And it is only by him that you can truly walk through the trials of this life with any confidence whatsoever that you are truly loved by the one who created you. Now, brothers and sisters, we have a great God who gave us everything that we might know him and trust him and love him and spend eternity with him. So what in the world could stand against us? Not the army of Alexander the Great, not the murderers and blasphemers of this world, not the wiles of the devil, the temptations of the flesh, or the enticements of this world. Nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. And that, brothers and sisters, is our firm foundation. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, what can we say? You are for us. You have promised us and shown us time and time again that you are for us. You gave us your only son because you are for us. So what could separate us from your love? We are assured this morning by your promises that indeed nothing, nothing can separate us from your love. And so all we know to say, oh God, is that we are not worthy, but we are thankful. And I pray, God, for your people this morning that this truth of your word would assure our hearts all the more that we would have greater rest and peace and joy in our great Savior who gave all that we might know that we are your children. For any in here this morning, Lord, who do not know Christ, I pray that they could know that love, that by the power of your spirit, you would awaken them from death to life, that they might walk in the newness of life and experience the joy of our great salvation. And we pray, God, you would do all of these things for your glory, for the strengthening of your church, that all together we might say, our God loves us and we love him. Thank you, God, for your word. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.